المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا أبو عبد الله أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وعلى حامل لواء الحسين أبي الفضل العباس بن أمير المؤمنين وعلى عقيلة بني هاشم زينب الكبرى ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات <تصفيق> اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سيجعل لهم الرحمن ودا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior Ajallahu ta'ala farajah sharif enlighten your souls purify your hearts with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد <clears throat> Respected elders, sisters and brothers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته These were young, brave men who gave their lives for the sake of Allah and for the protection of the religion of Allah They were sons of a man loved by hundreds of millions of people alive today and their father is known as the father of virtues. They are great role models for humanity but they are also examples of how parents should strive to bring up and to train their children. The sons of Qamaru Bani Hashim, Hamilu Liwa Al-Hussein, 
ابو الفض العباس صلوات الله وسلامه عليه are amongst a group of individuals whom perhaps history has not done enough justice. And arguably, there will be many who have not come across these honorable young individuals. The recognition that emerges is that the 10th of Muharram, Ashura and Karbala presents wonderful examples of sacrifice when it comes to people of all ages. You find the young, you find the old, you find the men, you find the women, you find people from different backgrounds and denominations, all coming together collectively in the spirit of sacrifice, in the spirit of emancipation from the chains of this world, collectively seeking the pleasure of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we recognize and we study the narrative of the 10th, we understand that perhaps some personalities have gained attention whilst the names and the stories of others have not necessarily got the attention that they deserve. You look at, for example, a man who is the companion of the Messenger of God, Rasul Al-A'zam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Anas ibn al-Harith was so old on the day of Ashura, narrations tell us he went to the battlefield with his back nailed. And his eyebrows were so down, covering his eyes, he was not able to see in order to fight. Therefore, the Ashab, the Ansar of Sayyid al-Shuhada, proposed an idea. They would tie a string from his head towards his eyebrows to raise his eyebrows so that he can see and fight and therefore attained shahada. You find, for example, a man by the name of Burair, one of the Ansar of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Burair was known amongst the companions of Sayyid al-Shuhada as a teacher of the Quran, as somebody who loved the recitation of the Quran from the people of Kufa. Yet one thing that he stood for and was outstanding on the day of Ashura was that he was smiling all the time, and in fact he was joking. They said to him, Burair, this is not the time to joke. He said, what is it? It is only a few minutes and I am in Jannah. Why should I not be happy? You have examples of individuals who are brothers, who fought together and attained shahada, yes? A man by the name of Abdullah and Ubaidillah, who were the son of whom who were the son of a man by the name of Yazid al-Abdi. Now Yazid al-Abdi was an individual who was from Basra. He had 10 sons. He said to his sons, why don't you join me? I'm going to the path of salvation. I am embracing the elixir of shahada with Sayyid al-Shuhada. Why don't you fight with me? Out of his 10 sons, only two joined him, Abdullah and Ubaidullah. They both fought with Imam al Hussein on the 10th, on the day of Ashura, and attained Shahada with their father. You have examples of brothers who fought against each other on the day of Ashura. You have, for example, a man by the name of Qurasafa bin Ka'bil Ansari. This man died 10 years before Ashura. He was a companion of Amir al Mu'mineen. His sons, one of them was called Umru and one of them was called Ali. Ali, the son of this man, was on the campsite of Yazid. Umru was on the campsite of Sayyid al-Shuhada. And on the day of Ashura, he attained Shahada, martyrdom. He fought courageously, valiantly. Now his brother who was fighting him shouted out, Oh Hussein, you kill my own brother. His blood is on your hands. Imam replies to this individual and says, in fact, he has attained salvation. He has attained martyrdom. It was he who sought to be indeed amongst the greatest. Therefore, you recognize that the 10th of Muharram presents to us examples of individuals whom perhaps we may not have heard of, that we require also to be acquainted with. These people deserve recognition. They deserve praise. But surely these and many others were inspired by great individuals on the 10th. And there was no one greater than what after Sayyid al-Shuhada 
than the loyal, altruistic brother, Abu al-Fadl Abbas, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Someone says, you, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, millions express your sentiments towards the son of Ali in a manner unseen, unheard of. The love for Abbas that exists in our heart cannot be spoken with our tongues. The love and respect and admiration we have for the son of Ali cannot be displayed in our actions. He sits in a special place in our conscience and our soul. And someone says, but why? I tell you, just enough is the, the words of the Ahl al-Bayt, the praise of the Ahl al-Bayt for this honorable individual. Ali Muhammad do not speak from themselves. They speak from what? From the essence, from the virtues of an individual. But what did Sayyid al-Shuhada say about his brother on the 10th of Muharram? One thing that is outstanding is the praise of Abu al-Fadl Abbas by his own brother. On the day of Ashura, this narration is beautiful. He says, Imam السلام, says to Abbas, may Allah reward you excessively for what you have done. Nasartani. You supported me whilst you're alive, but you also supported me after you died. Sayyid al-Shuhada knows that the millions who come to Karbala understand the essence and the greatness of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Sayyid al-Shuhada says, you are supporting me even after you leave this world. One of the most outstanding things said on the day of Ashura by anyone, particularly by Sayyid al-Shuhada, was that line that he mentioned about Abu al-Fadl. He said to him, Irkab bi nafsi ant, ride, may my soul be sacrificed for you. Hussein said, I want myself to be sacrificed for you. The poet said, on the day of Ashura, people were crying Hussein. Hussein was calling Abbas. This status that Imam alayhi salam says, Ride, may my soul be given for you, is truly mesmerizing. It reminds us of the beautiful description of the Quran where Allah says, Wa anfusana wa anfusakum. Ali was the soul of Rasulullah, Abbas was the soul of Hussein. And therefore you come to the conclusion that the Ahl al-Bayt praised whom? They praised this honorable individual, the fourth holy Imam, Zayn al-Abideen al-Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Famously says, Inna lil-Abbasi manzilatan inda Allahi yaghbituhu biha jami'u al-shuhada yawm al-qiyamah. There is a status that Abbas enjoys with Allah, that all the martyrs on the day of Qiyamah will look at him and say, we wish we had that status. The sixth holy Imam, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Famously says, كان عمي العباس نافذ البصيرة صلب الإيمان My uncle Abbas had clear vision of the heart. He would stand in his faith and his belief. جاهد مع أبي عبد الله وأبلى بلاء حسنا He stood to sacrifice. He was altruistic in his approach in life. That is why when you come to analyze and look at the various dimensions associated with the life of the honorable brother of Sayyid al-Shuhada, one area that perhaps has not been looked at is the sons of Qamaru Bani Hashim. Because no doubt today, many of the lovers of the Ahl al-Bayt, if they were asked today, how many sons did Abu al-Fadl have? Were they there in Karbala or not? Did they attain Shahada or not? There will invariably be many blank faces. And perhaps there is time 
for us to look at these honorable individuals. Because when we look at the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, perhaps we have also done injustice to their sons too. When we look at the seventh holy Imam, Babu al-Hawa'ij, Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. How many sons did Imam al kazim have? How many? 27. Other than the Holy Eighth Imam, can we name any other? Today? Are we able to connect to any of these individuals? Mention something of their lives? The recognition is there was an outstanding individual by the name of Ahmad ibn Musa ibn Ja'far. This Ahmad was so generous that in one occasion he freed 1,000 slaves. This Ahmad was so eloquent and courageous that people, when they saw him, they would stand up in admiration. They say he is the son of a great individual. He has acquired his qualities. He was so beloved to Imam al kazim yes, that Imam would shower praise upon him. Then you have another one. By the name of Al-Qasim in Iraq today, there is an entire city named after a son of the seventh Imam. Did you know that? It's called the city of Al-Qasim. He's buried there. Al-Qasim wandered away from Arabia because of Abbasi persecution. The horrors and the nightmare of Umayyad and Abbasi terrorism. And we have people who are Shia and say we should respect Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas for their achievements. This year we have. Anyway. This man, this great individual, Qasim, runs away from what? From the claws of the Abbasids. He goes to Iraq. He's not known by anyone. He enters a village. He sees two ladies washing clothes. He hears them. One of them say to the other, I swear by the man who is honored by Allah on the day of Ghadir. He says, you must be followers of Ahl al-Bay. Take me to the head of the village. She says, very well. They go to the head of the village. He says to him, I'm here, a visitor. Can I stay with you? He says, of course, you're very welcome. Doesn't identify himself. After three days, comes to him and says, Qasim says to him, I would like to stay, but I would like to do something. I can't stay for free and I will not accept sadaqah. He says, very well. Why don't you feed people water? He says, no problem. Later on, they see him as an abid, as an individual who loves the remembrance of Allah. So this Sheikh, the head of the village, says, why don't you marry one of my daughters? He says, very well. When he marries, he says, who are you? He says, please, I don't tell you who my father is. I'm just Qasim. They say, very well, until he's blessed with a young daughter. After a while, he falls ill. He's told that he will die. He says to his father-in-law, I am Qasim, and my father is Musa ibn Ja'far. The man shakes and says, how would I live my life knowing that I had the son of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far and not served him? man said don't worry but i ask you one thing take this daughter of mine to medina my mother would like to meet her he passes away his wife takes whom takes this young daughter goes to medina knocks on the door of the house of this lady najma khatun tuktam who is the mother of the eighth holy imam she opens the door she sees this little girl without anything says she must be the daughter of my son qasim tragedies of the Ahl al-Bayt that we have not heard of. The question that you might have today and we would like to look at is how many children did Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam have? How many sons and how many daughters? According to many studies that have been presented, opinions of ulama, historians, the most reliable or the most accepted opinion is that Qamaru Bani Hashim, the illuminating moon of the Hashemites, had six children, five boys, and one daughter. Who were his sons? Yes. Number one is a man by the name of Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas. Please understand the names of these holy individuals. At least tonight in honor of this great personality that we will give our lives for. We honor his sons without a shadow of a doubt. Ubaidullah is the most famous of the sons of al-Abbas alayhi salam. Why? Because the progeny of Al-Abbas continued through Ubaidillah only. He's the only one who had sons, and his sons had children, yes. Ubaidillah had a son by the name of Hassan. 
Hassan had five sons. They were all known for eloquence, for bravery, yes, for outstanding qualities in the community in Arabia at that time. Ubaidillah was very young on the 10th of Muharram. He was not present in Karbala. He was most likely with his mother Lubaba. Peace be upon Lubaba, righteous wife of Abu al-Fadl. Lubaba and Umm al-Banin, salamullahi alayhim, looked after Ubaidillah. Ubaidillah stayed in Medina because narration say he was only six years of age or even younger. The second son of Abu al-Fadl from Lubaba is a man by the name of Muhammad, also known as Al-Abbas al-Azghar, the young Abbas. And later I will tell you why he had two names. The third is a man by the name of Qasim. Qasim, the son of Abbas. Not much is known regarding what? Regarding him. The other individual that is known is Al-Hasan ibn Al-Abbas. Hasan, Qasim, Al-Fadl is another individual. Al-Fadl was somebody who, of course, was known also after Ubaidillah. Al-Fadl was a very eloquent person, known for his beauty also, yes? He would shine amongst the people. People respected him. However, history is silent on whether he was there on the 10th in Karbala or not. The daughter of Abu al-Fadl, we don't know her name, unfortunately. History has not preserved the name. In discussing and honoring the sons of this great individual, some individuals, some people would love to, would wish and yearn to be able to raise children similar or at least in the path of these sons of Abu al-Fadl on the sons of the Masumi. Parenting today has become one of the most difficult tasks, one of the most challenging objectives. There are many parents here tonight, I know. There are many parents watching and will watch later. As a parent myself, it is argued in this day and age that perhaps parenting has become much more difficult than many years ago. And many parents are feeling frustrated angry, confused when it comes to how to raise their children. They say, we wish we can raise them like the sons of the Ahl al-Bayt. We wish we can instill in them qualities like these holy individuals. But we're finding challenges before us. What kind of challenges? For example, the disconnection with faith. Some say, my daughter doesn't want to wear hijab. Some say, my son doesn't want to pray. He's 15, but he's refusing to perform salah. Yes. Some say they're being influenced by movements out there, LGBTQ+. Some say they're being influenced by celebrity obsession. Some say, unfortunately, that what they have relationships outside marriage, and they're not listening to us. There is peer pressure. They're friends, for example. Some come forward and complain about the role of video games, how much their children are playing video games, how much they're spending on their phones and on their iPads. And they're saying, I can't keep control 24 hours a day. I'm unable to keep telling them, do this, do this. And I am feeling clueless, frustrated, very angry. And arguably, this is one of the most testing time for parents today. The first thing to say is, parenting, it is not an easy task, but it's a much rewarding task by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, what? When we look at the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you and I, wa bil ihsana, after the establishment of monotheism and tawheed, there is a purpose behind it. When Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala honors parents and their sacrifice and their dedication, because it's a major investment. Some mu'mineen and mu'minat today, they look at parents as a secondary thing, as something on the side. That's why they don't enjoy it. That's why it's a heavy burden. That's why they're always worried when they get home or when they 
speak to their children because they see parenting as a magnificent, heavy burden on their shoulders. Allah says, I have honored you by giving you a responsibility. You have these sons or daughters of yours. They are your legacy. They are your investment. They are your keys and your path to Jannah. Therefore, grasp it. Embrace it. Enjoy it. I have yet to see or hear any of the parents say, I love parenting. Why? Some people say, maybe you haven't tasted proper parenting. I beg to differ, yes? In the recognition that today we need help. Support is necessary. Parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, there is a need to establish support networks for parents. People think, all of a sudden, I get married and I have children. I'm already ready to train my kids. I am equipped with the tools of tarbiyah. Who says you are? Which course did you take? Which development plan did you go through? Molana, I don't need. Alhamdulillah, my parents taught me and I know exactly how to parent my children because I know how my father and mother treated me and I will treat them the same. Because it worked for me. Bismillah, mashallah. I'm attending Thursday nights. I come to majalis. I pray on time. It will work for my children too. And you know exactly what I'm about to say next, isn't it? In the recognition that many have faced a wall. What's going on? All the ways that my father and mother utilized on me are not working on my children. I'm facing a blockage. There is a wall that I am encountering. Help! Nothing wrong with saying help. Today, we need parenting courses much more than ever before. Today, we need support networks. We need every jama'at, every community, at every level to have telephones and means by which parents call and say, help. I don't know what to do with my son or daughter. There's nothing wrong with that. And people are ashamed. They feel that it's an inadequate or a insufficient or something that illustrates weakness. No. We are all going through this together. We need as much support as possible. I would like to look at this subject by answering a number of questions. Number one, what is the purpose of parenting? Number two, what are the main elements when it comes to the style of parenting today shown by psychologists? Number three, what is the most important factor as demonstrated by some individuals also looking at the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt that will enable us to be successful parents? Number four, how do we utilize this practically? Tools. Number five, very important. If my son and daughter is not practicing Islam, if they're not connected to Allah and Ahl al-Bayt, how do I get them back? Number six, who were the sons of Abbas who were present in Karbala? What did they do? And how did they look up to their father? What qualities they would have picked up from the brilliance of their father? Qamar Bani Hashim, Abu al-Faddil Abbas, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. A question that perhaps we have not asked ourselves today is, what is the goal of parenting? If we were today to ask some of the parents here, what is it that you wish to achieve in life? What would be your response? Some would say, I want my son and daughter to be good Muslims. Some would say, I want my son and daughter to be happy. Some would say, I want them to be successful in this world. True? These are the common answers we'd get if we ask people, what is your goal of parenting? What is your objective? Unfortunately, however, the recognition that emerges is there are many parents who have not identified the goal of parenting and tarbiyah as we have in Islamic teachings. In the idea that A, perhaps there is a different vision between the father and the mother, number one. Number two, even if they've identified their parenting styles and methods do not support this objective. You say to me, give me examples. Tonight is all about examples. Practical lessons, inspirations from these great individuals that we consider them our role models in order to practically change in this particular path. For example, someone says, I want my children to be happy in life. 
Therefore, subsequently, what would be their parenting method? They would come and whatever their child wants, they give them because they want them to be happy. Result, spoiled child who comes to the conclusion that in life, others have to serve him or her. Yes? Number one. Number two, someone asks a parent, when you see a problem or a challenge in your day-to-day -day life with your son or daughter, what is the immediate thought that comes to your mind? Here, I would give you two scenarios. Put yourself in one of them. There are those who look for short-term short results, and there are those who consider what is known as long-term parenting. What do we mean? Somebody, give me, I'll give an example. A son comes to his mother and says with his disappointment, they've stolen my bike. Why did they steal your bike? The mother screams at him. Because I forgot to place the lock and the chain. Those at the first category, the short-term results, do the following. Screaming at the son. It's all your fault. How dare you? You're irresponsible. How many times I've told you to secure your bike? How many times I've told you to look after it? And then says to, his, to their son, after a few minutes, don't worry. I will get you a new one. That is whom the first group of people, parenting. There is a second which has shown to be successful and very powerful. That is the path that we need to take. In this first category. And that is what? Long-term successful parenting. Utilizing mistakes of children to build a rapport, but also to be able to give responsibility and ownership to the child to make that decision themselves. So what is the alternative? Instead of screaming at them, instead of blaming them, instead of criticizing them, the second type of parent looks at the child when they've told them that their bike is lost, and sits down, calms their emotion, does not go in rage, and has a discussion with their child, and says, why do you think this happened? The child says, because I did not lock the bike. What do you think should happen in the future? It is empowering the child to come up with solutions. It is giving the ownership to the child. The child begins to uh, take responsibility, but the child also then recognizes, I am loved by my mother or father, whatever I do, but I realize I have done a mistake. I need to be able to fix this mistake myself. The problem that we have, and tonight I'm going to go through a number of myths and mistakes that parents do in their relationship with their children. One of those is this, that we think in order to fix something, immediately I have to find a solution. I have to give my child something for them to feel better about. Whereas a better strategy is to think what would be beneficial for them long term. This needs more patience. This needs more perseverance. It needs an understanding of what? Of the fact that parents are building the character of their children. They're not solving their problems straight away. They are what? They are looking for the long term. Here is an important realization. Somebody says, what is the different types of parenting that we have? Because today, no doubt, culture has had an impact on the way that we parent our children. There are those who have learned certain parenting styles. And I am going to go through three parenting styles for us to learn which one is the best and which one should be avoided, yes? The first parenting style is known as the authoritarian parenting style. Please bear with me. Those who are parents, this will be useful. Those who want to become parents, this will be immensely useful. Those who are already parents and their sons and daughters are married are also will be benefiting from this as grandparents. And those young children, inshallah, will become great parents when you're older. Who is an authoritarian parent? It's an individual who makes all the decisions in the family, as, far, as parents are concerned. They expect the kids to follow without asking any questions. The parents take the kids as inherently ignorant. Yes, They have high expectations for kids on what they want, and the only way they parent the kids is through punishment and reward. So when the child disobeys, they say, how dare you disobey? I am your father. You should respect me. I know exactly what to do. How dare you do this? Everything is through punishment and reward. This is an authoritarian parent. 
I remember there is a famous proverb in Iraq. Yes? It's regarding making sure that we do something properly, not hastily. And a person who is labeled with this is a man by the name of Mullah Alawi. Now, Mullah Alawi, what did he used to do? He used to say to his sons in Iraq back in the time that you have to pray your Fajr Salah. If you don't pray, there is something called the stick. Yes? There is something called the stick. No doubt. So what did they do? They are frightened. And they used to sleep because it was hot in the summer. They used to sleep out, uh, outside on the roof of the house. But they used to take turns, the, his sons. Every morning, at Fajr time, one of them wakes up, goes and pours water down the drain. And the father who is downstairs hears that there is water being used. So he, then he comes to the conclusion that they've woken up, they're doing wudu, and they're praying. And it's the turn of every child one day. So they say, tomorrow is your turn to wake up and pour the water. One day, this Mullah Alawi decided to inspect. He went up and he saw one of his sons pouring the water. He says, what on earth are you doing? He says, father, all this time we are praying, not for the sake of Allah, to stay away from the wrath of Mullah Alawi. That's what our salah was for, isn't it? Yes. That's the first type of parenting. It's shown to be not an effective means. Sometimes it's needed, but not all the time. The second type is called the permissive style. Please understand these. The permissive style is what? Permissive style is that when a, a parent is lenient, they don't impose rules, they avoid confrontation, and they want the happiness of their children no matter what. Because they feel if they do anything, their children will turn against them and will not like them. Here there is an example. That a parent comes into the room, finds a child who is supposed to wash the dishes, is watching TV. In the first instance, the authoritarian style, the parent screams at the child. How dare you? I told you to wash the dishes. The child says, can I just watch the game? It's 1-0 to Leicester, and I think they're going to equalize the other team, because they usually do. Therefore, I want to complete the game. The father says, no way. If you do so, you'll be banned for a week. What does the child get this message? Only things work in life through threats. That's the only way I can get by. The second style is the child's watching the football game, and the parent comes in and says, my dear son, why haven't you washed the dishes? So I'm watching the game. He says, very well, don't worry, I'll do it. This is the what? This is the permissive style, which is also problematic. The third type, please understand this, this has been shown today through studies, analysis, to be the most effective parenting style. This is referred to as what? As the authoritative, not authoritarian, Authoritative style. What does this refer to? This is when the parent seeks the view of the child and maintains a personal authority but seeks to problem solve. They see mistakes as great ways to learn. They empower the children to develop self-discipline, personal responsibility for actions, and therefore the child gets the idea that there will be consistent rules and they belong to a team in which they are consulted. Let's use an example. The father enters, or the mother, sees the child hasn't washed the dishes. They are watching TV. What does he do? He sits next to the child, eye level. Looks at the child in a calm manner. Says, can I talk to you for a few minutes? Says, okay. Says, what, do you remember with the discussion we had? Says, yes. What am I expecting you to do? The child says, you're expecting me to wash the dishes. The father or the mother says, have you done it? Says, no. The father or mother says, what do you expect to happen next? What do you think? Now, there may be resistance initially. If this method is not used, there may be a turning or an ignoring from the child. But usually, if there is consultation, if there is dialogue, if there is that warmth, the child begins to understand that there is a problem-solving exercise. It is also part of long-term parenting, yes? Now, based on people's temperaments, the child's temperament, their parents' situation, sometimes you need a mixture of those. However, 
This last parenting style is deemed to be one of the most effective ways and it requires a teamwork between father and mother to be able to understand that many a times they need to be calm, they need to ask the children, they need to be at the level of the children, they need to engage with the children to have a meaningful discussion so that an outcome is reached. Here, there is a need to understand a very powerful, very useful, very, very important point as to what makes a successful parent, please understand this. Today's studies have shown this. Over 600 studies, 600 studies have come together and what? Through research studies, they have shown that the most effective means of parenting today is parent-child connectedness. It is when the parent develops a connection with their son or daughter. What does this ref refer to? This is known as the super protective factor. Today's studies have shown that parents who are connected to their children will ensure that their children, number one, are in a state of well-being. Number two, their health is much better. Number three, when they're older, they do not fall into habits of some adults, like what? Like crime, for example, like addiction. Also, they're more likely to succeed in life when it comes to jobs, when it comes to health, when it comes to wealth, yes? Connection, connection, connection. This is absolutely key. Please understand this as a parent. Many of the problems we have today as parents is because we are not connected to our children. Either there is weak connection or there is no connection at all. That is a major issue that we have. You say to me, for example, what? You have a five-year-old daughter or son. You are watching TV. Or you're, inshallah, watching a majlis or reading a book or whatever. The child comes to you and says, Father, Father, can I show you this drawing of mine? Can I show you this game? Father, Mother, can you play with me? What happens usually is, no, 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 I'm busy. No, 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 let me focus. Go and play with your, with your siblings. Or you say to your wife, or the wife says, I don't have time, I'm cook." Then some of our mu'mineen have asked me and others, Mulana, when I come to my teenage son and daughter, when I'm picking them up from college or university, I say to them, Qasim, Abbas, Haidar, how are you today? Alhamdulillah. How was college today? Good. What did you do today? Nothing much. I say, Mulana, they don't speak to us. They're very reserved. Every question we ask them. And when they have problems, they don't open up to us. When they have issues and challenges, they don't come and speak to us heart to heart. Do you know why? Because you did not invest the time earlier on in their lives. You did not invest in connecting with them. Because the moment you connect with them, they will open up to you. They will speak to you. They need you. But when you do not have a connection with someone, you feel what? You feel there are barriers. There is resistance. You are not able to what? To confide in them. That is why today we find that one of the major challenges in parenting is parents connecting to their children. Look at the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us these great individuals, they connected with their children. In which way? Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam and Yusuf. Yusuf had a connection with his father. Otherwise, he would not come and open up about the dream. Qala ya abati inni. I have seen my dear father. Yes? You have Ibrahim alayhi salam, his connection with Ismail. If it wasn't for that deep bond, Ibrahim would not come to say son and say, what do you think? If Ibrahim was an authoritarian parent, he would say to Ismail what? Allah has commanded me that I slaughter you, you have no say. Do you agree? If you were the parent, and Allah comes to you and says, I want you to kill your son. Would you go and say to your son, excuse me, my son, can I ask your opinion? What do you think? Allah has told me, what do you think? No. Yes. The challenge today is to learn from these wonderful examples. Yes. Wonderful people who established a connection. The million dollar pound question that you will have now is how? Tell me practical ways that I can connect with my children. 
and alhamdulillah, here I'm going to present to you a number of very, very important what? Very important points that we take away, inshallah, before looking at the honorable examples of the honorable people of the Ahl al-Bayt, especially the sons of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. A son or a daughter of yours comes to sit next to you and says, Father or mother, I have a problem. You immediately say, what's the problem? I don't feel connected to God. It will be fine. You're just going through a phase. This is how it is. Are you familiar with this? Or they come to you and say, one of my friends spoke ill about me and I'm so angry. How dare she speak ill of you? Don't worry, leave her. The first important tool for connecting with our children is to listen effectively. Many times we listen not to understand, but to reply. And what we do is we negate feelings. We say life is like this. We make it about us and we try to fix the problem. Those four things we should avoid. They're wrong. Listening is very powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادِ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا Allah says, surely, verily, they hearing and the sight as well as the speaking or the heart, you will be held accountable for. Why is it that he starts with the ears? Why is it that the last thing that will switch off in the life of human being is listening? Listening is very powerful. You know, the Holy Prophet Peace and blessings be upon him and his family used to be an individual who loved listening to people to the extent that the Quran says he had a nickname. Yaquluna Udhun. They used to call the Prophet of Islam someone who listens, ears. The Quran says, Qul udhunu khayran lakum. Yes, he used to love listening, but that's good for you. That's beneficial for you. Yes. Unfortunately, the power of listening has been slowly diminished because we are impatient. We don't want to listen, yes? We don't want to understand. Listening is very important. Now, listening means what? This is another lecture that's required, but very, very briefly. Sometimes, unfortunately, what we say is, we say listening is just passive. No. Listening involves us sometimes reiterating and repeating that which has been said to us. It comforts the child. So is this how you feel? Is this what you're going through? Is this your experience? So they get assurance that you are with them. You are feeling what they're feeling. That is part of listening. Listening should not involve any judgments, any statements that places them into disrepute, puts them down. Listening means attentively seeking to exercise empathy. To be able to understand where they're coming from, but not to offer solutions. Because I tell you, men, especially, we, men, are very solution-orientated. Our sisters, the ladies, mashallah, Allah has blessed them. They're more what? Process-orientated. What does it mean? Let me give you an example in marital lives. Yes? When a husband comes home from work, the wife looks at him, says, I've had a terrible day. The husband says, why? She says, the wishing machine is broken down. Our son is in trouble at school because he didn't do homework. The husband immediately says, don't worry. I'll fix the washing machine and I'll sort out the son. But the wife is not looking for that. She's looking for empathy. She's looking for someone to listen. She's looking to say, is that true? Is that really? Well, tell me, how do you feel? Allah, I guarantee now the sisters are saying, oh, where were you before? In the idea and the recognition that listening is powerful. Something which is a tool known as listening tool. This we need to develop, yes? Number two, very important, is love. When the religion of Islam, the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt, espouses love, isn't it? Mawaddata fil qurba. We need mawadda, mawadda. Some of our brothers do not show enough love to their children. How many times do you say to your children, I love you? How many times have you hugged them? How many times have you expressed your affinity with them? Isn't it? Love is a key factor to establish connection from a young age. Don't be shy. A man came to the Prophet of Islam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have never hugged my children. The Prophet says, if you do not show mercy to your children, Allah will not show mercy to you. 
Look at the example of the Prophet of Islam, Amir al Mu'mini, constantly hugging, loving, kissing their sons and daughters. Yes, nothing wrong with it. Doesn't take away from masculinity. Yes, learn the love languages. There are five love languages today, we are being told. In other words, there are people who love to be loved in their own way. Some of you have heard of these, yes? Sometimes it's gifts, sometimes it's words, sometimes it's acts of service, sometimes it's quality time, sometimes it's personal physical touch. Learn your children's love languages. That is of their utmost importance. Learn to avoid triggers which makes you angry and therefore not love subsequently your children. The third final point that I'd like to mention in regards to connecting with our, with our children. These are not exhaustive lists, not comprehensive. But some of the important tips that we have is to have special time with your children. Special time means what? Maybe 20 minutes a week set aside for an activity that your child loves an activity that you have personal one-to-one -one with your child yes it could be playing it could be walking it would be conversation it's nothing to do with telling them what to do or scolding them or instructing them but listening showing love doing something together with your child try it 20 minutes a week yes an activity that they love this will enhance connection yes take your son for example to a football game that you are going to watch and so on this, these are important points. The recognition that emerges today is that when it comes to people asking the question, there are those amongst my children who do not practice faith, have turned away from Islam, are not interested in deen, they're not interested in religion and practice. Tell me tips very quickly as time is short. I'll give you five important points. Number one, lead by example. Be an exemplar. Be a good role model. In other words, what? If you want your son and daughter to love salah, then you start with yourself. Some people say, I already do it. Maybe you need to enhance this. If you want your children to pray on time, you pray on time. If you want your children not to watch haram, make sure you don't watch it too. Yes? This is an instruction from the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt. The second area is importantly character building. What do we mean? We have something in our souls known as the mir, the conscience. We need to develop that, strengthen that amongst our children. We can't be their CCTV watching them 24 hours a day. Please understand this. What does this mean? We need our children to be able to love Allah and fear their sins. Meaning that I cannot have myself constantly selling, telling my children, don't listen to this music, this is halal, this is haram, this is that. Yes, I could train them. I could educate them. I could give them broad guidelines. But I need them to take ownership. I need to empower them, yes, to be able to look for these things themselves, to ask the questions, to engage and debate with them. Building of the vamir and the conscience requires a lot of hard work, but it produces great fruits. And it should start from a, a young age. Third, do not dismiss them any time when they come to you with a problem. When they come to you with a concern. Or they've come to you with a sin. God forbid someone comes to you from your son or daughter and says, I've started taking weeds, drugs. Some people say, Azar. They start slapping themselves, screaming agony. What have I done? Ya Allah, why are you punishing me? Calm down. Take a breather. Yes? Everything happens for a reason. There are tools to deal with these particular situations. Don't dismiss their fears because they will go to others who will prey on their vulnerabilities. Number four, make sure that ibadah is something that is beloved. Meaning what? That many times we don't perform salah to jama'ah at home. Why shouldn't the father and the mother and the children pray collectively? Make it something pleasant. Yes? Ibadah sometimes can be activities done together, stories of the Quran discussed together, what was mentioned in the majlis on the way back in the car together. Have a family meeting once a week where you discuss something of relevance, a question that some of your sons and daughters have. If you do not know the answer, seek the answer. Yes? And importantly, number five, learn the stories of the Ahl al-Bayt. Learn the stories of the Quran. Stories are very powerful. They're inspirational. A key thing here, however, of great importance is, sometimes people say, but I've tried all this. My son or daughter still doesn't pray. Why? Look for the reasons, the root, the causes. Seek help. Understand that everything has basis. And I tell you, this love of Ahl al-Bayt is profound. This love of Ahl al-Bayt, if we install it in our children's hearts, there is always hope. 
Yes, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. comes forward and says teach your children a number of things Quran, connection with the Quran many a times we become ritualistic with the Quran recite this verse memorize this ayah the child comes doesn't know anything I remember when I was a madrasa teacher in one of the jama'ats in the UK they told me make sure they've memorized Surah Al-Qadr I came to the children I said do you know what this Surah Al-Qadr is about they said they have no idea what is it about but we'll be told to memorize it. Okay, memorization is good. But take your children through a journey in the Quran. There are tools out there. Invest time. Yes. Invest effort. Isn't it? Similarly, we are told what? We are told this association with the Ahl al-Bayt, don't take it for granted. Meaning what? Take your family for ziyara. Invest. I know that at the moment, the situation, COVID, and so on. But inshallah, when you feel it's safer, or if you feel now it's safe, if you're being vaccinated and whatever, take your children for ziyara. Invest. They will indeed be inspired. Take them for umrah. People, mashallah, go holidays, X destination, Y destination, all over. I don't want to mention them from the member. No problem. If they're halal. But also invest in the akhirah as well as the dunya of your children by connecting them with the Ahl al-Bayt. This Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, a companion of the Amir al-Mu'mineen, one day came home, saw his daughter eating honey. He says to her, what are you eating? She said, a man was sending this and he said, this is a gift. He said, this is a gift from whom? He said, it was a gift from Muawiyah. He said, my dear daughter, this is not honey. This is poison. She said, why? He said, because this man wants you to have this so that you dissociate yourself from Ali ibn Abi Talib. The moment he said this, she began to take it out forcefully and vomit the honey out. She would say, nothing can stop me from the love of Ali. <laughs> ya Ali. That's why when you come to the sons of Abu al-Fadl, you recognize that they were inspired, mesmerized by a father who had tremendous qualities. A father who had outstanding characteristics, yes? They would look at him and they would learn memorable lessons. The first is altruism, isn't it? That to look for the benefits of others before yourself to sacrifice for the sake of others allahu akbar how amazing this would be to teach our children similarly they would learn from their father abu al-fadl the beauty of loyalty on that night of ashura and the eve of ashura when abu al-fadl is given immunity from al laeen al shimr he says where are those who belong to our tribe Abu al-Fadl Abbas does not want to come out. Imam al said to him, go and see what this individual wants. He comes, he looks at him, he says, what do you want? He says, I've come to give you immunity with your three other brothers. There is no hesitation. There is no moment of reflection. Immediately, Abu al-Fadl, with a stern face, with an angry response, says, اللَّهُ وَلَعَنَ أَمَانَتَكَ أَتُؤَمُّنُنِي وَابْنُ بِنْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَا أَمَانَةَ له. You give me immunity. May Allah curse you and curse your immunity. Where is the protection of the grandson of the Holy Prophet? This is loyalty, yes? Unwavering dedication and commitment. They learned from their father patience. Because you know, wallah, it was not uh, easy for Abu al-Fadl to remain there and not say a word when he saw the children agonizingly suffering with thirst. And when he saw Shuhada go and not come back, but he would not say a word. Yes, he was patient and patient and patient. And he had to endure all the calamities and difficulties up until his martyrdom. Similarly, the sixth holy imam pray, recites and says the following, Ashhadu laka bit taslim. Oh, Abu al-Fadl, I bear witness, the imam says, that you had full submission. What tasdeeq and you affirmed well wafa and you were loyal when nasiha and you would advise people these are qualities that they saw in their father yes submission whatever happens i go with the command and the plan of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finally when we recite the ziyarah of abul fadl what do we recite how many times you've thought, thought about this assalamu alayka ayyuhal abdu salih O righteous servant of Allah. You know in tashahud, what do we say in taslim? Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadullah al-salihin. 
the righteous servants of Allah. Why didn't Allah tell us in tashahud to say, وَعَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الْمُتَّقِينَ Why not, وَعَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الْمُخْلَصِينَ وَعَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الصَّالِحِينَ And Abu al-Fadl is told, As-salamu alayka ayyuhal abdu salih Salih means what? Virtuous. Looks for good. Wants to help others. Acts of kindness. Is active. Is seeking to fulfill the needs of others. What an amazing quality to teach our children. To raise them to be excellent husbands and wives. Responsible, compassionate, kind, empathetic in society for the cause of others. Not miserly. Not only looking for their own benefits and their own success. And there are so many other lessons from the glorious, illustrious life of Abu al-Fadl. The question is, did he have sons who were martyred on the day of Ashura? Yes. According to Riwayat, one of his sons who attained Shahada on the day of Ashura is a man by the name of Qasim ibn al-Abbas. He and his brother, who is called Muhammad al-Abbas al-Azghar, emerged before their uncle after the Shahada of Abu Fadl. And they begged Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. They were young. The narration tells us that in Kufa, a man came forward and said, I see on a spear a young face of a man who did not have beard. He was illuminating with light. So he asks, Who is this young man? They said to him, He is Al Abbas. Narrations tell us though, that of course, Qamaru Bani Hashim, Abu al-Fadl had a beard, and he was older than this young man. So this, and the, this individual, when he was told, this is Al-Abbas ibn Ali, therefore the narrator had mistaken, because this is Al-Abbas al-Azghar, the young Abbas, who was the son of Abu al-Fadl. They both came forward, they asked their uncle, uncle said to them, your father has already given his life. They said, we beg you, allow us to go. They were given permission and they attained shahada together. Allahu Akbar. Look at these brave young souls. And Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salamullahi alayhi, was an individual who would always be remembered for all these qualities. But one of his titles is Saq al-Atasha, the quencher of the thirsts. Do you know what I say? I say, Ya Qamar Bani Hashim, Ya Abu al-Fadl, tonight all our hearts are in Karbala. All our hearts are next to Abu Fadl, yes? We say to him, Ya Abbas, you wanted to quench the thirst of your brother and all the children in the campsite. But today you quench our hearts and souls. You are saq al qulub wal anfus. Yes? This is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And I tell you on that day, the soul of Abbas was mesmerizing because the pain that it had to go through but still remained resolute and steadfast. But that soul could no longer take the screams of al-Atash al-Atash. The children this young Sakina bint al Hussein Ruqayya, all those innocent souls, days without water, wanting a sip of water. What crime have they committed? That's why Abu al Fadl stands before his brother. Those were difficult moments for Imam al Hussein because he says to him, Akhi antahamilu liwa'i, you are my standard bearer. Abu al Fadl says, I know. But I can no longer tolerate the screams of the children. Please allow me to ask for water. Let me get some water. 
The first instance with Abu al-Fadl asking for water. They said to him, you will never taste water until you get to Jahannam. He looked at Abu Abdullah. He said, Akhi, they're not giving us any water. Let me fetch some water. Yes. Uh, Abu al-Fadl Abbas, courageously, this, young, this man who is full of valor. Yes. Uh, people said it is as if it was Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battlefield. He marched through the enemies of Allah, committed, focused. Cursed, uh, determined to get the water. There are 4,000 enemy combatants before him. He dismisses them. He reaches the river bank of Al Qamis. Uh, he looks at the water. The feeling that the water is cold is felt by his hands. He raises the water, looks at the water. The whole of humanity watches. Historians look. The time froze. Abbas through the water. Ya nafsu min ba'dil Hussein huni. O soul. How can you taste the water when Hussein is thirsty? He has a mission, the poet says. Abbas, feeling the coldness of the water, did not remember himself. He remembered Sakina and Zain. That was within the mind of Abbas, yes? He fills the water container. Now his mission was to get back, yes? Assalamu alayka ya qamar bani Hashim. Allahu Akbar, this determination, this commitment, now he marches, now he gallops towards the campsite of Aba Abdullah. Those are the moments history will write. He looks right and left. He takes away the enemies of Allah. They cannot face the son of Ali head to head. They cannot face this brave individual in such a manner. They have to hide. They have to uh, strike him from behind the palm tree. A man strikes the right arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. When the right arm drops on the ground, Abu al-Fadl cries, Wallah, in qata'tumu yameeni. By Allah, if you strike my right arm, inni uhami abadan an dini. I will continuously fight for my religion. Imam in Sadiq al Yaqini. This is my Imam. He is truthful. Najlun Nabi Tahir al Amini. He is the grandson of the Prophet. He is pure. He is trustworthy. He continues. There is still a mission of Abu al-Fadl. He needs to get the water back, yes? But another man hides. This time the left arm of Abu al-Fadl is severed. This is the moment of difficulty. Yet Abu al-Fadl still has his, uh, has his uh, mouth. He holds the water container with his mouth. This arm of Abu al-Fadl that drops on the ground. I tell you, narrations tell us a number of imams of the Ahl al-Bayt kiss these arms. One of them was Amir al muminin He kissed the arm of Abu al-Fadl, the hands of Abu al-Fadl. Another was Imam al Hussein. On his way to Abu al-Fadl, he kisses the arms. Another was Imam al sajjad When he came to bury Abu al-Fadl, he sees the hands of Abu al-Fadl on the ground. Qamaru Bani Hashim is standing on his horse. He is holding the water with his mouth. He is thinking of that child who hasn't tasted water. He is determined. The narration says the arrow pierces through the water container. The poet says, Abu al-Fadl did not feel the pain of the right arm being severed. He did not feel the pain of the left arm being taken away. But when the arrow pierced the water container, the heart of Abbas broke. The heart of Abbas was shattered. One of our ulama maraja, one of our great scholars, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Ibrahim Al Qazwini, he was reciting a majlis in the courtyard of Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas. In one night, he reached the point before what? Before Abu Al Fadl was struck, but he did not continue the musibah. He says, "I could not bear the musibah of Abu Al Fadl. I finished the majlis. Next night, he came. He recited." 
recited the entire musiba in a way that he's never ever recited before. When he finished, they said to him, Sayyid, why did you not recite the musiba the night before? And now you're reciting a musiba in such a way. He says, Wallah, last night, after I recited the majlis, I saw in my dream Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He said to me, Sayyid, why did you not recite my musiba? Let me tell you, O oh Sayyid, that moment I was on the horse when the arrow pierced through the water container, I indeed recognized I cannot get the water to the children. My heart was burning with pain. He said, Sayyid, do you know what happened to me thereafter? I felt the arrow in my left eye. When I felt the arrow in my left eye, I began to move right and left. I wanted to remove the arrow. I could not remove the arrow. I had no arms to remove the arrow. He said, when I was trying to remove the arrow from my eyes, I felt the pole on my head. I felt the spear on my head. Sayyid, I felt on the ground. I did not have any hands to control. Sayyid, do you know now how I fell on the ground? I fell on my face. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Abu al-Fadl has never called his brother Akhi. That moment he cries out, Akhi Aba Abdullah, alayka minni salam. My brother Hussein. I salute you. Aba Abdullah has never said this about anyone. That was the moment when Sayyid al-Shuhada, the son of Ali and Fatima, looked up and said, Al-an in kasara dhahri. Now my back is broken. Al-an qallat hilati. Al-an shamuta bi adui. Now I am weak. He rushes towards Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. The next sight uh, breaks the heart. Wallah, wallah. Imagine uh, Abu al-Fadl is on the ground. He has no arms. His face, there is the arrow covering one eye. The other eye is covered with blood from his head. He cannot see anything. But he can hear. He can hear a man walking close to him. He says, I ask you, O oh man. I ask you by Allah. Do not take my life life away. I am waiting for my brother Hussein. Please don't take my life away. Aba Abdullah sits next to Aba al-Fadl. I ask you, when you have a loved one who is about to leave this world, what do you do to them? You want to hug them, isn't it? You want them to hug you. I ask you, Hussein, so what? He saw Abu al-Fadl without arms. It is as if Hussein says, Akhi Abu al-Fadl, please hug me for the last time. Please, I want your warmth and hugs. Hussein, Hussein, Hussein. Abu al-Fadl now sees it's Aba Abdullah next to him. The narration says that is the moment where Aba Abdullah came and began to hug the chest of Abu al-Fadl. He kissed the cheeks of Abu al-Fadl. It is as if Abu al-Fadl says, Akhi Hussein, you kiss my chest, but who will sit on your chest? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is next to Aba Abdullah. These are the final moments of Wida'. Imam al Hussein picks up the head of Abu al-Fadl, places the head on his lap. But Abu al-Fadl, despite all the injuries, places the head back. Imam al Hussein raises it again. This time Abu al-Fadl places it back three times. Imam says, Akhi Abu al-Fadl, why don't you let me look after you the last moments? Abu al-Fadl says, Akhi. 
أبا عبد الله You want to look after me uh, But I wonder who will look after you uh, You will be غريب and alone on the plains of Karbala uh, It's as if Abul Fadl says uh, How dare I being looked after by you uh, But I am not next to you to look after you uh, At that moment the narration says Imam Al Hussein now wants to pick Abul Fadl Abbas Take him back to the campsite Im Abul Fadl looks at Aba Abdullah Allah. This is the final wida. The last thing he says to him, the eyes, the one eye that can see of Abul Fadl looks at the eyes of Hussein, the brother he love, the final wida. He says to him, Akhi Hussein, I beg you leave me here. Why, why? Let me take you. Water, water, Sakin. The children, the children. Zainab, Zainab. Aba Abdullah looks at the soul of Abbas leaving his body. He cannot pick up the body of Abul Fadl. He returns to the camp with his back knelt. The first person he sees standing there, waiting in anticipation, asking around, is Zainab. He looks at Zainab. Zainab looks at Hussein. She is wondering, where is my Abbas? Where is my protector? One narration says, Aba Abdullah doesn't say a word. His head is down. He walks towards the tent of Abul Fadl. He enters the tent of Abul Fadl. He takes away the pole of the tent. The tent collapses on the ground. Zainab cries out, Wa Abbas! Wa shaheeda, wa gharibah, Allahu Akbar. When the shuhada of Karbala were buried, the Ahl al-Bayt, they came back in Arba'een to the site of their burial. I leave you with this. Uh, narrations tell us uh, that women, children, they would run towards their beloved, to the graves of their beloved. They asked, where is Zainab? They were told she is next to the river of Alqami. She is next to the grave of her beloved Abbas. She was sitting next to the grave of Abul Fadl talking to him. This is the moment for the sister to speak to her beloved brother. Yes, uh, Abbas would not indeed ride on a horse before he finds and makes sure that Zainab is what lifted. She's comfortable. He would be there always beside her to protect her with tears coming down her eyes. It's as if she says to him, Akhi Abul Fadl, where were you when Shimmer slapped me on my cheek? Akhi Abul Fadl, where were you when the hijab was taken away from us? Akhi Abul Fadl, I wish you were there to protect us when the la'een poked a spear on Sakina. Babul Hawaj. Tonight, don't leave the majlis without connecting with Abul Fadl. Leave your hajat with Abul Fadl tonight. Huh? Your heart in Karbala. You are with Zawar al Hussein and Abul Fadl tonight. Yes. Wallah, Abul Fadl would not disappoint you. 